Welcome to this second of three videos on algebraic centralities. In the first video, we introduced a recursive way to define importance. That is, a vertex is important because its neighbors are important. We then reviewed eigenvectors and eigenvalues for square matrices. And today, we will see that eigenvectors and eigenvalues are exactly what we need to make sense of this recursive definition of importance. Here is the motivating example from the previous video. For the undirected network on the left, links give you power. And there are three vertices with maximum degree, 2, 4, and 6. But vertex 4 is the most important vertex because it has the strongest collection of high degree neighbors. For the directed network on the right, in links give you power. And there are two vertices that have in degree of 2, vertex 3 and vertex 6. And in this case, the directed edge going from 6 to 3 gives vertex 3 a really big boost, and therefore 3 is the most important vertex in this network. So let's look at our first centrality measure that uses this recursive definition of importance. Eigenvector centrality was introduced by Philip Bonasich in his study of bargaining power in networks. You can think of eigenvector centrality as degree centrality with a feedback loop. This allows the power of a vertex to propagate to its neighbors. In other words, the score of a vertex impacts the score of its neighbors and its neighbors neighbors and so on. That's the intuitive idea. But for now, let's jump to the official definition of eigenvector centrality. We start with the adjacency matrix A of the network. We find the largest eigenvalue of that matrix along with its corresponding eigenvector. We then scale that vector so that its largest entry is equal to 1, and then we're done. The eigenvector centrality of vertex i is the ith entry of this scaled eigenvector. Let's find the eigenvector centrality of our undirected network example. So here is the adjacency matrix for the network. And the first thing that we do is we find its eigenvalues, and we're interested in the largest one. And in this case, it turns out that the largest eigenvalue is lambda is equal to 2.54. And then we find the corresponding eigenvector v over here. And so what this equation means is that if I multiply this eigenvector by a, what we get is a vector in the same direction as v, but about two and a half times the size. Okay, so what we know is that the entries of this vector v give us a ranking of the vertices. So I'll label these so that we have the vertex numbers next to these entries. And what we see here is that vertex 4 is the winner. We also notice that vertex 6 is pretty close behind, actually. It's almost as important as vertex 4. Meanwhile, vertex 2 lags behind a fair bit. In fact, vertex 2 is about as important as vertex 5 when we use this measure, even though vertex 5 only has degree 2, while vertex 2 has degree 3. Let's put eigenvectors aside for a minute and talk about another way to find Bonastich's centrality scores we will recursively calculate the power of a vertex based on the power of its neighbors. To start, we will assume that every vertex has equal power, say 1. Next, we update the power of each vertex to be the sum of the power of its neighbors. And so this gives us another vector. Then we repeat this process using the new power scores. And we keep on doing this until the ratios of these power scores converge. So we get these stable values, and then we use this vector, which we normalize so that its largest entry is equal to 1, and that becomes our centrality score. Let's apply this recursive process to our example network. I will apply the update rule for round 1, and then I'll let you do the next two rounds. All right, so in round 0, every vertex starts off with a score of 1, and I am going to update the score of each vertex to be the sum of the scores of its neighbors. And so vertex 1 has one neighbor 2 whose score is 1, so I put a 1 there. 
next 2. 2 has 3 neighbors, each has a value 1, so I put a 3 there. 3 has 2 neighbors, so I put 1 plus 1, which is 2. And you can see that, in fact, after this first round, the power of a vertex is actually equal to its degree. All right, great. Now it's your turn. Pause the video and calculate the power scores for the next two rounds of this algorithm. That is, the new power score of a vertex is equal to the sum of the power scores of its neighbors. Okay, here are the power scores that I calculated for four rounds of this update rule. I've also normalized these values here for the fourth round so that the largest value is now 1. Meanwhile, on the right, I've written the actual eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix. And for this small network, the iterative values are already quite close to the eigenvector values, even after four iterations. So this example gives us some evidence that the eigenvector centrality really is a feedback loop centrality, where we are using our neighbor's power to determine our power. Our update rule corresponds to the matrix equation x sub t is equal to a transpose times x t minus 1. So let's show that this matrix equation really does calculate the new power score by taking the sum of the power scores of my neighbors. So here are the two networks that we considered earlier in the video. In the middle of the slide, we see the matrix multiplication A transpose times some x vector. On the right, we give the resulting vector, and we can see that the updated scores are as desired. I get the new score of a vertex by summing the scores of the neighbors. When we have an undirected network, the adjacency matrix is symmetric. In other words, A is equal to A transpose. So in this update equation, I could have used A or I could have used A transpose, and I would have gotten the same answer. However, when we go to a directed network, the adjacency matrix and its transpose are different. So if we want to capture the proper update rule, which is that in links give you power, then we actually have to multiply by a transpose. So we will write this update rule as a transpose times x t minus 1 is equal to x t, so that it's consistent for both the directed and undirected networks. It's interesting to note that for a directed network, multiplying by the original matrix rather than the transpose corresponds to the update rule, outlinks give you power. And I hope that that makes intuitive sense. So now let's prove this recursive process converges to the first eigenvector of the adjacency matrix. The secret is the spectral decomposition theorem that we talked about in the last video. As a reminder, this theorem says that when we have a nice matrix, meaning that it has n orthonormal eigenvectors, then it can be written as the weighted sum of rank 1 matrices. These rank 1 matrices come from the eigenvectors of A, and the weights are the corresponding eigenvalues. So let's suppose that A is a nice matrix, meaning that it has a basis of orthonormal eigenvectors. And let's remind ourselves what this means. Uh, it means that if I take ui transpose uj, so this is also the dot product, so this is equal to 0 when i is not equal to j, and it's equal to 1 when i is equal to j. So the spectral decomposition theorem tells us that we can write a in this form, so we're taking ui dot ui transpose, and we're weighting it by lambda i. And what we'll see now is that we get a very similar form for a squared. So the squared here manifests as an exponent here on the coefficients. So instead of having lambda i, we now have lambda i squared. And likewise, if we want to find an expression for 
a to the t, well, it has that exact same form, but now my coefficient is lambda i to the t. So let's see why this holds. And rather than doing it for the general n case, let's just do it for n equals 2, and we'll get the idea of what's happening. So the first thing I'm going to do is write down the spectral decomposition of A using my two eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Next, I'm going to write A squared as the product of these two equations. So let's expand this out. First, let's multiply these two terms. So I get lambda 1 squared times u1 u1 transpose u1 u1 transpose. So then I notice that I have a u1 transpose times u1. That's just equal to 1. And so this term actually becomes lambda 1 squared u1 u1 transpose. That's going to be the first part of our sum. I can do a similar calculation for the u2 part, and I'm going to end up with lambda 2 squared times u2 u2 transpose. So now we just need to see that the last two terms are actually 0. Okay, so I've moved things around so that I can just look at one of these two other products. Uh, let's do that one. I get lambda 1 times lambda 2, u2, u2 transpose, u1, u1 transpose. And if I look at this middle term, you see I'm taking u2 transpose, u1. Now, since these are orthogonal, that's actually 0. And so this entire term becomes 0 as well. And the same thing happens for the other term. That one is also a 0. And so ultimately, I get that a squared is just the sum of these two terms, which is what that formula tells us. And then this keeps on going by induction. So now you know why we are very happy to have orthonormal eigenvectors for our adjacency matrix. So we're getting very close to the end of our argument. Now that we have this nice expression for a to the t as this linear combination of rank 1 matrices that we get from the eigenvectors, and here the weights are the lambda i's to the t's. And so here's the next result that we need, and this comes from the very powerful perron fabrinius theorem that I'll state more generally in just a little bit after we've worked through this calculation. But here's what we'll be able to conclude from this big theorem. So number one is that if I look at the largest positive eigenvalue, then we know that its magnitude is strictly larger than the magnitude of any of the other eigenvalues of the matrix. In other words, I would say that lambda 1 dominates the others. And the second thing that we get is that if we look at the corresponding eigenvector for this largest eigenvalue, we know that all of its entries are non-negative. This is what's going to let us get a ranking from this eigenvector. All right, so let's put both of these things into action. So we know that when we multiply the matrix A by itself t times, I can write it as this linear combination. And so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply a to the t times x. And x is just some vector in Rn. And we know that the eigenvectors for the matrix are orthonormal, and so they are a basis. And so that means that I can write my matrix x as a linear combination of the eigenvectors u1 to un, and that's what I've done here. And now I am just going to multiply through by a to the t, and I can write this as the sum as i goes from 1 to n, sum as j goes from 1 to n, of lambda i to the t u i 
UI transpose. Alright, I need a UJ and I need the C sub J out there. And once again I can use the fact that my eigenvectors are orthonormal and so this product here it's either 1 or 0 it's 1 when i is equal to j and it's 0 when i is not equal to j. And so I get lots and lots of zeros lots of things cancel out and what I'm left with is this expression and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out a lambda 1 to the t and when I pull out this lambda 1 to the t all of the coefficients for the eigenvectors except the first one have this term that is some number that's strictly less than one raised to some power and when I take some fraction between zero and one and raise it to a power it gets closer and closer to zero and so each one of these approaches zero as t gets bigger and what I'm left with is just some vector that's in the direction of u1 and that's exactly what we want. That in the long run the values that we assign to each of the vertices is proportional to the entries of the first eigenvector. And so now we're ready to bring it all together. In our power score algorithm we start with an all one vector. Every vertex starts off with power one and then we apply our update rule by taking the sum of our neighbors power and we can write this update rule for vertex i like so because aji is equal to 1 when j is adjacent to i and at 0 otherwise and then we can write this in matrix form so here we're just writing that equation above it for all n vertices simultaneously and this is the same as saying x sub t is equal to uh, a transpose applied t times to that initial vector of all ones. And as we saw in the last slide, this results in a vector that is basically in the direction of the eigenvector for the largest eigenvalue of the matrix A. And that's the end. Okay, it's not quite the end. Remember that I made a few claims about the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the matrix A. And so here's the justification, the incredible perron frobenius theorem. Seriously, this is a big theorem and it's ridiculously useful. And you'll need to find an advanced linear algebra book if you want to see a proof. The perron frobenius theorem is actually even more general than what we need, so I've adapted it here for our use. So here's what we know. We have a graph that's connected undirected and aperiodic. So aperiodic is the new word for us. This just means that the graph is not bipartite. You can't split it into two pieces so that all the edges go from one part to the other. It's also not tripartite. You can't split into three pieces with this property. And it's not fourpartite or fivepartite and so on. You just can't break the graph apart in this way. All right, so when you have one of these nice graphs, then here's what you get. First, the largest positive eigenvalue dominates all the other eigenvalues. Its magnitude is bigger than all the other magnitudes. And you also get this nice property of its eigenvector, that all of its entries are non-negative. And those were the two properties that we needed in our proof. So this amazing perron frobenius theorem fills in the last claims that we made about the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of our adjacency matrix. And we are done. So to recap, bonus stitch introduced eigenvector centrality for an undirected network. The scores correspond to the entries of the eigenvector for the largest eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix. Finally, these scores are the limiting values of a recursive feedback loop where the power of a vertex is updated to be the sum of the powers of its neighbors. In our third and final video on algebraic centralities, we'll look at what happens when we look at feedback loops on directed networks. It turns out that eigenvector centrality is going to have a bit of a problem, and we're going to fix that by looking at something called cat's centrality.